Good morning and welcome to this online service. My name is Reverend Josh Penduck. I'm the rector of St. Giles and with St. Thomas in New Garden Lyme. It's a privilege and a joy to be able to welcome you here today. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that um, by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. So we're going to come now to our confession. When I say, um, Lord have mercy, if you respond by saying, Lord have mercy. When I say, Christ have mercy, if you respond by saying, Christ have mercy. So... Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. Let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, we have done evil in your sight. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord God, we are sorry and repent. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Bible reading is taken from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then. What you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? And whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors, and to, the God, and to God, the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Religion should stay out of politics. You've heard that one before, haven't you? Um, whenever the uh, Church of England bishops make any comments, the government, uh, whichever government it is, Labour or Conservative, will always say religion should stay out of politics. You know, speak about morality and things like that. That's what you're supposed to be doing. It's a, a fascinating thing. It's And uh, it goes back to, funny enough, this saying of Jesus in our Bible reading, when Jesus said, give to, uh, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors, and to God the things that are God's. So, basically, for a very brief interpretive history, over 2,000 years, this came to mean, for many people, that you've almost got two realms side by side. You've got the realm of the, the emperor, that's the state, or things like that, and then you've got the realm of God okay that's belongs to like the church and things like that so this really developed especially in the medieval time where you had even two sets of laws the uh, the laws of the king and um, then you had the laws of the church and sometimes you could get uh, arrested by the laws of the church sometimes by the laws of the king just so you know the laws of the church and the punishments were a lot less bad than if you were um, punished by the king, hence why people often wanted to get punished by the church instead. Um, so then what happened bit by bit during the Enlightenment time, as the church got pushed out more and more, it became more of a private thing um, for people. And so um, what would happen is that um, the, um, the 
you would have your own personal private faith, but the idea was that you kept it out in the public space. You kept it out in the public space. Um, so much so that eventually it came to the point where nowadays, as soon as a Christian gets involved in politics, they're saying, get your religion out of politics. We don't want your religion um, in politics. I mean, we saw this, we see this again and again and again, where politicians have their religious views and then they also have uh, in private and then they have their actual political views and when suddenly their religious views become public shock horror my goodness me so that was one of the ways of interpreting it um, another way came out of the the german reformation reformation after martin luther and the big reformer in the 16th century who helped reform the church um, to being what it was meant to be uh, um, biblically. And what happened, he really emphasised a passage from Romans chapter 13. And in Romans chapter 13, St. Paul talks about, you know, be submissive to the, the ruling authorities, um, be uh, um, because they are instituted by God. And so he said that, well, that means you've got, um, we as Christians need to submit Commit to the ruling authorities. God's put them in positions of power. And so therefore, whatever happens, don't rock them out. Let them get on with what they need to do. We just keep on carrying on with our worship. And this keeps on going and going and going until eventually you get to the 1930s in Germany and uh, Mr. Hitler rises to power. And what do the Christians do? Rather than stand up against Hitler, they say, no, he's been instituted by God. Um, he's um, And we're, we're supposed to submit to him. So literally, millions of Christians submitted to Hitler because of that idea. Now, the question then arises, is this what really Jesus is saying here? Is it the case you've got two realms? You've got the public realm, you know, the realm of the state, of taxes, of politicians, and then you've got this private realm, this realm of religion, and ne'er the twain shall meet. Is it the case that, you know, we're, um, we're supposed to just let the politicians get on with their political stuff and keep to ourselves with our little moralities and things like that? Is this what Jesus is saying? No. Not at all. Not at all. And um, I, I think it helps us um, to literally just go through this story step by step to look at what it is talking about. OK, so we start in verse 15. It says, now, then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So this is trying to be a trap. For The Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. Okay. So they sent their disciples to him. Now notice this. Along with the Herodians. Now, most people these days would just like go, okay, yep, along with the Herodians. In these days, you don't see how explosive this is. Okay. It's almost as if um, Labour joins with the Conservatives to get at somebody. When you've got Labour joining with the Conservatives to get at somebody, you know something is big. Because the Pharisees and the Herodians hated one another. They really hated one another. The Pharisees were all about pure, be, living their pure, holy lives, observing all the law. Meanwhile, the Herodians were like, OK, we as Jews, we need to accommodate ourselves to um, the... Uh, um, accommodate ourselves to uh, the, the modern-day Greek society. We need to take Make up Greek culture and things like that, and so they were basically like, um, um, like um, accommodate ourselves to power and things like that. So these were the guys as well who were kind of working with the Romans. Remember, this is a society which is occupied by a foreign oppressive power. Um, this is a society that is um, occupied by um, a. It's all, all think of it almost like. Um, France in the 90, early 40s occupied by Nazi Germany. This is what you need to think of. So what we have here is you've got all the people, not the resistance fighters, but all the people who hate the French and all the people who are collaborating 
uh, sorry, all the people who hate the Nazis, not hate the French, all the people who hate the Nazis and all those who are collaborating with the Nazis coming together. This is how big this is. The Pharisees and Herodians come together and they're trying to trap Jesus. This is showing the kind of impact Jesus is having. And then they come over and they come up with this kind of dripping, dripping flattery. And it's so insincere. They say, teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard the people with partiality. Ugh. Sickening, isn't it? It's kind of like they're, they're trying to praise him. Oh, Jesus, how great you are, how great you are. And yet what they're trying to do is trap him. So you know those times when people come up to flatter you, but actually they're, they're trying to stab you in the back. You know those kind of situations. And then suddenly they get out their knife. They say, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Okay, so let's remind ourselves of that analogy I gave about the Romans occupying the land of Israel. That analogy I gave about Nazi Germany occupying France in the early 40s. So it's like asking the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to the Nazis or not in occupied France? That's the kind of question. Okay, is a clever question because as soon as you ask that question you, you you're basically asking okay um, is it lawful um, to help put keep a occupying and oppressive power in place because that's what you do with taxes is it lawful to do that is it right to pay taxes to an oppressive empire now if Jesus says yes, it's right to pay taxes. He now looks like he's on the side of the collaborators. He looks like he's on the side of Nazi Germany, say. Uh, yeah, let's support the Nazis. That, that's basically what, what's going on here. So if he says, yeah, it's lawful to pay taxes to the Romans, to the emperor, well, then what happens is that the people are going to hate him. They're going to hate him. And they've already said, you don't treat the people with partiality with partiality so be truthful about this you know don't care about the people but the people are going to hate him and they're going to think of him as this uh, collaborator what happens if he says no it's not lawful well there's a there's a roman garrison just here in the temple and uh, as soon as they heard that jesus is saying no it's not lawful to pay taxes to the emperor what's going to happen they are going to come over and they are going to arrest jesus execute him as a resistance fighter he's with the resistance against the romans he's with the people like the zealots the zealots were the people who were um, fighting the Romans at the time. They're like the French resistance. And so Jesus, whatever he answers, he's between a rock and a hard place. If he answers, answers yes, he's um, the people are going to hate him, not going to listen to him. If he says no, uh, then he's going to get killed by the Romans. So this is an obvious trap. Jesus is so clever here. You, you just need, when you actually read, once again, in the context, this is so clever. Jesus, it says, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. Okay, so he knows. He knows they're hypocrites. I mean, you've got Herodians and Pharisees coming together. That that's an obvious, clear indicator that these are yeah, this is a test. But nevertheless, he, he then says, Show me the coin used for the tax. Okay, so they've asked him about tax. Um and so he asks for the coin used for the tax. And so they brought him a denarius. Immediately, if you know the context, this is like alarm bells. A denarius. Because the denarius, 
Um, it's a Roman coin, and it has on it the image of the emperor. The image of the emperor. It's also got the emperor's title on it. So, where are we in this story? Where's the location this is happening? It's happening in the temple. Okay. Remember um, the story about Jesus overthrowing the tables of the money changers. Well, there's a reason why money changers were in the temple. Because um, in order um, to buy sacrifices in the temple, you had to have temple coins. The reason being is because you cannot... What's the second commandment of the Ten Commandments? That you don't make a graven image of any god or anything like that, or of any idol. Well, the thing is, with Roman coins, because they had the image of the emperor on, they had an image on them. So you can't have an image in the temple. What's more, the emperor was considered a god. People would make sacrifices and worship the uh, the emperor, especially in the provinces. So, so in places like um, Palestine, where this was happening, um, the Roman soldiers would be making sacrifices to the emperor as a god. So, on a denarius, um, you've got the image of a false god. Okay? So that means when you take it into the temple, you need to change it immediately for a a, a kosher coin, a temple coin, in which to pay for the sacrifices. But hang on a second. They've brought him a denarius here, and they've got it in the temple. Why, why have they brought him a denarius? It means they've still got it in their pockets. They've still got the image of a false god in their pockets. And what's more, the title of the emperor was, guess what? Son of God. Lord J Julius Caesar, or Lord Tiberius Caesar, or Lord Caligula Caesar. Um, son of God. That's why the uh, when the Christians, they really emphasise Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. So uh, he is the true son of God rather than this false son of God, the emperor. So here they have this image of a false god who's, got, who's claiming the title son of God. And so he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? So they've, he's already exposed them as hypocrites is it because they've got this, this image of a, a false god on their coin in the temple and they should have changed that for a temple tax they shouldn't be going around the temple with this image on and so he said, said whose head is this and whose title and i i imagine them a bit sheep shamefaced here you know a bit sheepish they're saying uh the emperors you know the emperors looking around looking at their shoes type of thing so they've been exposed now as hypocrites. These are not people who are trying to either liberate uh, liberate the people. Okay? Uh, these are not on the side of the occupying power. These are people who who are with the, the occupying power. They're keeping his money and they're sac um, they're making the sacrilegious act of bringing a graven image into God's holy temple. And so, bear in mind all this context. He said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. That whole context helps us to understand what's going on here. We're not saying there's a realm of the state and the realm of religion, public stuff and private religion. I'm not just doing that. Because if we've got the emperor's image on, why don't you just give it back to the emperor then? If it's got his image on, after all, if you've got somebody's picture, you can give that picture back to them. Give it back to the emperor. So Jesus is not saying here that you don't pay taxes, but he's changing the way you actually pay taxes to this foreign oppressive power. He's saying, OK, yeah, you get, you pay your taxes, but all, not because uh, of a, uh, 
um, it's you obliged to, but rather, well, it's got his image on, you give it back to him. And then you've got the phrase, and to God the things that are God's. What belongs to God? After all, God created everything. And in the Psalms it says, the earth is the Lord's and all that fills it. So everything's God's. You give to God what is God's, which means, ev and everything belongs to God. You give your whole life to God. There's no distinction between the realm of politics and the realm of religion. There's no distinction because the realm of politics belongs to God as much as our personal private devotions. The realm of um, taxes and um, justice for the oppressed and um, how we relate to foreign powers and uh, the nature of our own borders um, and, e and the NHS and transport and um, even culture, things like that. It all belongs to God for the earth is the Lord's and all that fills it. And so we offer to God everything we have. Yes, the emperor has his bit for the time being, but emperors come and go. You give back his image to him. Emperors come and go. But your life is to be devoted to God. And all things are devoted to God. This is why, um, the, as opposed to Luther in the Reformation, um, another tradition under John Calvin uh, of those which said hang in a second hang in a second jesus is not just being quite uh, um here's the realm of the state and you must submit that there's there's something more complicated going on here and it's why actually the uh, calvinists said you could actually rise up in rebellion against uh, an unjust oppressive power uh, a tyrant if you like and so uh, um it, it's really important thing to remember that um, kind of uh, subtlety going on because the earth is the Lord's and so that means when the next time you hear a politician say uh, religion should stay out of politics remember you give to God the things that are God's politicians come and politicians go they have their days yeah we give them their due in um, season we're not supposed to kind of be horrific to them but you know they come and they go the important thing is we give to God that which is God's which is our whole lives and even politics belongs to God let us pray we start with a prayer for Israel and Palestine um, in the words of Archbishop Hossam of Jerusalem. O God of all justice and peace, we cry out to you in the midst of the pain and trauma of violence and fear which prevails in the Holy Land. Be with those who need you in these days of suffering. We pray for people of all faiths, Jews, Muslims and Christians, and for all people of the land. While we pray to you, O Lord, for an end to violence and the establishment of peace, we also call for you to bring justice and equity to the peoples. Guide us into your kingdom, where all people are treated with dignity and honour as your children. For to all of us you are our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Faithful God, sometimes our faith feels weak. The trials of life test our faith and we find it hard to rejoice. Help our faith to grow and help us to realise that it's the most important thing in our lives. Show us how to rise above our human weaknesses and to grow stronger in our Christian faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for your world. Forgive us when we are ungrateful, when lack of faith and spiritual blindnesses prevent us from appreciating the wonder of your creation and the endless cycle of nature. Forgive us for taking without reaping, reaping, taking without giving, reaping without sowing. 
We pray for the farmers of the world. And especially pray that those in poor areas may be treated with fair earnest for their labours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we hear Jesus' call to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, we pray for our governments around the world. Praying that you may give them wisdom in all the complexities of governing, that their all governments may be places of justice, of fairness, of goodness. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for our loved ones, for those who lift our hearts and those who turn our hair grey. We pray for those we instinctively warm to and those with whom there are frequent misunderstandings. Lord God, we thank you for opportunities of forgiveness. Living God, we pray for the homeless and the hungry, the broken and bereaved. For all, all for whom this day brings sadness and little joy. For the sick, lonely and helpless. For those whose hope has been shattered and their faith destroyed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. 